Welcome to the Aiki Dojo podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center in Los Angeles, and with me is Mike Van Ruth, Fourth Don Aikido, Fourth Don Yado, and Bill D'Angelo, Aikido, Fourth Don. Um, so this morning, Sensei, we have a question from a student, uh, Miriam, and she sent us a quote from Furu Sensei's book, Kodo. And uh, the quote reads, uh, and I'll read it in full, uh, Today in our fast-paced world, I think students of martial arts need to plunge deeper into their training. It is not that training needs to be more intense, but that training should pervade our whole lives. And then Miriam's question is, how have you applied this into your daily life throughout the years? Oh, so she's... <clears throat> Miriam is asking the question. She's asking a question about the thing that every Aikido is talk, or every tr traditional martial artist talks about, that the training is supposed to improve your daily life, right. bleed over, and that's true. But it's it's kind of um, not the right thing to say in the beginning. No, because you have to kind of. What do you mean? What do you mean by that in the beginning? Well, because you have to preface it. It's just like, oh, you start uh, um, eating chocolate that that makes you uh, gain weight. Well, no, chocolate itself doesn't make you gain weight. Eating too much chocolate. Eating too much chocolate, right? So then, yeah. in this sense, like you have to think contextually, right? How does the training? How does the training um, improve your life? And at what level does it begin to improve your life? That's the hard part. Do you think that when she's talking about how does Aikido improve your life or going deeper into the training, is it, um, is it, the, is it the aspects of training or is it the principles of Aikido that she, she's uh, alluding to, that um, harmonization or is it the discipline of training or it's the combination of those things? When she gives us this quote, and all three of us have read Furiya Sensei's book probably multiple times, what do we think is being alluded to um, in the quote in terms of delving into the aspects of training. So that's the thing is that contextually, like you're asking these questions about, you, the things that you're, you're asking are not what people are, are thinking. Okay. But, but that's the thing that they're supposed to be thinking, right? So when we think about um, how Aikido improves your life, it's not Aikido, it's not the dojo, it's not me as your guru, as the teacher, it is the training. Right. The training is the thing which improves your life. The sacrifice that you have to make to go there. The, the stick to and the perseverance that you learned by going there. The fortitude that you uh, got in your life because you had to get back up after that person threw you down. Right. Those are the things which, which somehow benefit your life. So when we think about like... Aikido or traditional training is supposed to bleed into your regular life and make your regular life better. It's supposed to, but the hard part is that at what level? Right. And then at mm -hmm. what the different levels, people, you mistake the power that you get from training for as your own, and then you run off to do whatever it is you do. Like for instance, there was a there was a person and this is a phenomenon, I don't know if just if this is just this dojo, other dojos happens as well as that. They start to train, they they find some power, and then they go, I'm going to run off and go do something else with this power. Right. And do so... Oh, what, no, I was going to say, I, I, I empathize and, and, and remember that, that arc. I think that students have an arc, right? I mean, you, you begin here, you get this certain level of power, and that affects your psychology. And hopefully, eventually, you... you you peak from that, and then you go you go down to a different level of psychology. Well, the, but that during that arc, and that peak is that's a good way to ref, um, explain it. They go, "Wow, I I was afraid to train, I was afraid to roll, I was afraid to get thrown, and now I'm not. I'm going to quit Aikido and go become a cop." Right. And then so they take that power that they think that they have, and that, that this doesn't just happen to um, beginners. Season, season Aikidoists, season martial artists, they, think, phenomenon. they go for this phenomenon where they go, I, I, I found my power, I'm going to quit and then go do something else. 
but they don't realize once you leave the dojo you lose it bleeds off it bleeds off <laughs> yeah yeah it does <laughs> you know for and you have to have that connection because that connection is the thing you know like you go here and the the thing that the teacher is trying to do is the tre- teacher is trying to figure out who you are the whole time and some people are really good at hiding who they are i mean some people spend a decade here and you go oh shoot that's who that person is right but the teacher's trying to figure out who you are. And once they figure out who you are, they go, okay, now I got to push Mike or I got to push Bill in this direction. Right. And then you go, wait, what? I, how did you know I was like that? You know, so you go, oh, Bill has a problem cleaning the bathroom. And then you go, oh, I, I didn't know that. And then now I go, Bill, you have to clean the bathroom. And you go, what? And I go, <laughs> and then the whole time you're cleaning the bathroom, I'm like, what was that? What was this? You clean the bathroom and you're just like, Wow. And then you learn to let it go. Nobody wants to be pushed in that direction. But the thing is that the teacher pushes pushes you in that direction to make you better. Yeah. And one of the things I was thinking, Sensei, when I, when I read the question uh, over before our meeting was, um, one of the things that, that she could be getting at is uh, when we take our training outside the dojo is the way we treat other people. Uh, in, in the sense the, that we're ed, trying the to etiquette aspect. Well, of it. etiquette. Yeah, I mean, etiquette is a one way to look at it in the sense of res- of respect. That when we're training, we have to care for our partner. We we have to be careful not to injure them. Even even when you're training as hard as you can, and you're going right to the limit. Um, you know, in our dojo, there's a no injury policy. Like you know, you have to be smart about not injuring yourself, and then being smart about not injuring your partner. And I think that. Having that, as she says, trying to find that correlation between the inside the dojo and then outside the dojo, having that sense of caring and um, consideration is a, that was something that really struck me that, that um, because that's a way to fight selfishness. Mm. Um, and our society, you know, we're a, we're a, we're a get for ourselves society. A lot, not always, but I mean, we we do have that motivation in our society: earn more money, get a bigger house, get a bigger car. Um, and I think that one of the things that the dojo teaches is a is a consider the other person first. That seems to be a, an aspect of the training. And if you if you can take that out of the dojo, I think that 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 adds to your your life in a positive way. Mm. Yeah, how you <clears throat> even. Yeah, you know, I notice how people treat servers at a restaurant, and you're like, you you witness some of these acts, and you're like, oh man! But you know, every time they come by and fill up your water, thank you. It's always you know that yeah, etiquette. etiquette. No matter what level they are, and I don't know if I told this story before, but in the way what you're just talking about, and going that tangent, but back where, when I was going to school, we did the, those summer art projects with my the chair of the department, Tony Marsh. Unfortunately, I was just by the AT&T building and saw that the installation's gone because AT&T left and the installation's gone. So I'm like, oh, a p- page of my history gone, eliminated. But during the process of working, we were in the glaze room, you know, glaze spraying these things. He would be in the spray booth spraying these pieces. I'd be handing the new piece, grabbing that piece away from him. You know, he'd wash off his hands. He'd turn around. He'd have a, a towel ready to hand to him to wipe off his hands. This would go on for you know, an hour, hour and a half without even saying a word. Mm. He would turn around, boom, whatever he needed was right there. Okay. And then he'd turn around, whatever he needed was right there without even saying a word. And his comment was, he goes, because his background, he spent two years training under a master potter in Japan. And he said, you know what? I don't mean this to be an insult, but the (laughs) way you operate is very Japanese. Interesting. I go... Why is that? And he goes, typically, you know, I work with students and they're like, hey, can I get this? Hey, can, can you get, you know, it's constantly trying to communicate what he needs. Right. Where he would just turn around and he didn't have to say anything. He was ready to go. And I explained him where I trained and, you know, and everything. He's like, oh, I makes understand sense. now. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But again, like you are talking about before, not just thinking about yourself. What does he need? When's he going to need it? constantly being on the ball because that's what he went through being an assistant to that master potter yeah he had to go through that training of being ready to have everything ready for him and all those other things 
and then all of a sudden it kind of shocked him that he comes back and he's working with this other white guy who's doing those things. He's like, where where do you pick that up? And I think it really it 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 really affects your all your relationships in life if you can be more considerate. It's hard to do because. Most of the time, you want to be considerate for yourself. You're like, I'm hungry. Get me some food. I'm tired. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. <laughs> all, all these, all three of us know this because we've all traveled together, and we all get cranky, and we want to, we want what we want for ourselves. Um, so the three of us know this because we've done it together. But it's it's hard when you're tired to do the thing where you're like, oh, Mike needs this, or oh, Sensei needs this. You're like, no, I want to get, I want the food for myself. But I think what Miriam's talking about is, like, how do you do that? And I think that that's where, since you've talked about this, it's, like, if you constantly train over and over and over again, it's like with the potter, like, you develop that pattern of behavior. And if you've trained for 20 years, the pattern of behavior hopefully gets ingrained into your daily life so that you do it automatically. I think that's where the benefit comes in, is you do it automatically, like, like Mike's talking about. Well, that's the thing. It's like you're trying to think about... How does the training, right? That's why I said it's not Aikido, it's not Karate, it's not Judo, it's not Kendo. It's the training that, you know, you, as a martial artist, you recognize that how you treat people will affect them not punching you in the face. Right. Right? So you go to a bar, you excuse yourself when you walk, accidentally step on someone's foot instead of just walking through selfishly and stepping on somebody's new $200 Jordans, right? But like... That's where you, you, you come to understand that line of, well, if I do this, there's going to be a consequence. And maybe, I don't know, is martial arts training consequence training where you learn right. how to – you realize that everything has a consequence. Right. If you drop food on the ground, at some point you're going to have to clean it, it up. up. And the longer it sits there, the more it gets ingrained in the carpet and the more it ruins the carpet. So you might as well just clean it up now. Right, right. Or if I, if I don't say – good morning to the other students and then one person doesn't really like me already and then that person thinks I have a problem and then now I got to fight the person right you know and so maybe that's where the training somehow comes in and and improves your life because you you realize like oh the dishes are in the sink got to wash them those are my dishes or that you go uh, Bill's dishes are in the sink he's a really busy guy I'll just wash them right. and then I don't get upset about washing them because it's just the act of washing them. It's just the act of picking up the food. It's just the act of, and that's part of the training is to, as we talked about the other day, stress inoculation. The inoculation of, is it's not that big a deal. You know, people ask me, you know, about like seeing gross things in the clinic or in hospitals, and I just go, yeah, nothing, nothing shocks me now. Right. You know, and like right. I have children. Right. I had to wipe up behind them. <laughs> had to clean. The other day, our, our housekeeper was there cleaning up the house. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we didn't do a very good job cleaning up before she came <laughs> because there was so much so much food under the under the kitchen table. I was like telling the kids the next day, you kids, you can't, can't do, do this. It looks really bad on us. You know, but that's part of your training is to realize that if you drop a piece of paper or someone else drops a piece of paper in the dojo and you just leave it there. It's bad. It's a reflection. Right. Right. And so this is a primarily a Japanese thing, but most Japanese traditional martial arts are done in in places that are fairly pristine. Right. Very clean. Very clean and very meticulous. So there's this idea that there's a correlation between this pristine training space and this, and this I don't know, this civilization or the civilized mind that you have as a tr- as a martial artist that you don't let the floor crack and so every every other day someone breaks their toe and the crack on the floor you don't break your training partners you don't break the training space you clean up the water after you take a shower at the dojo you do all these things because you care you learn to care about the yourself other people the training space that you don't just let the floor have a crack you don't let the wall the the wall the paint paint on the wall just peel uh not my place you think i i want to create this civilized mind this pristineness within myself so then i do that in my exterior life i clean the floor i pick up this thing i say excuse me i mend the hole in my uniform you just don't let these things go because those things all become a pattern of behavior like you're saying and so the pattern of behavior becomes 
you're trying to create like you were saying that everyone is inherently selfish right so like it, we are all inherently selfish we're all inherently primal rough right but we're trying Animal. to smooth that out make yeah it, make our not just make our training space pristine but our ourselves pristine to where someone could step on your shoe and you don't have to fight them for it right someone could spill a drink on you and then you don't have to punch them in the face you just go that's how life works but that is, but it's a, it is not. What Miriam's talking about is not a, a thing that you achieve. It's a practice. Right. You're, you bow to someone before class, and then maybe every once in a while you, you just kind of go, oh, no, it's us. and then someone goes, hey man, what'd you say? That? And you go, oh, I'm sorry. Right. And then you have to self-correct. Right. But that's so, you have to maybe that's a good way to say it, is that training enables gives you the self-correcting mindset. Process, yeah. And then it gives you the power to say, like, you know, like, you have to be self-correcting so that you know that there's a problem. And then you fix the problem. But then you start to self-correct your life, right? And so there are, like, people, there was a student two or three decades ago who was a bus driver. And then he, after he became a black belt, he realized that he could do anything. And then he went on to become a lawyer. Oh, wow. I don't remember that student. Yeah. And then, you know, even, like, for my own life story, like, I didn't graduate from high school. Right, but then, so, but shortly after high school, I started training in Aikido, and then I went along. To, I got you know not to brag, but I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate. Right, right. That that the power of training gave me the power to fit, realize I could do anything. Right, as long as I put my mind to it, and to become more disciplined, you know. And so, it, the hard part is is in, tra in a traditional life traditional martial arts training these lessons come in a very painful way you make a mistake the teacher s smites you and then you go ah i'm never gonna do that again you right. remember the sting <laughs> so uh, you, you know people like uh, stories so here's a story from my training so i'm not very good with directions right i don't know my left or my rights so i don't know north from south you know, I live in the same place for like 30 years, and I know that the mountains are in the north. So I go when someone says go go west, I immediately go, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like it's so ridiculous. So uh, we had all these Japanese visitors come from Japan. We had a, it was over 20 students from this dojo. The, our former sister dojo came and visited the dojo, and I was driving a group of people, and the person I was following was driving a group of people. After dinner on the way west side of los angeles we're driving back and there's all this traffic and the person i was following just started oh, driving you, all crazy you got lost and Gosh. this is before gps cell phones yeah or anything this is this is thomas guy which that dates oh, I us remember that. thomas guide is a map book that you would have to look up and figure out how to get home and then the map book goes you know go to b4 they, they, you have to like find your way back so I'm on the freeway, and I'm not from that part of town, and I'm driving, and the person I'm following, he has all the girls in his car. I have all the men in my car. <laughs> and then he starts driving all fast, all crazy, and I'm just like this. Oh, my gosh. So I'm driving, and then as we get close to downtown LA, little Tokyo, I go, okay, this is the, the exit. I go to get off, and it's blocked off because they're having some Aww. festival. And I'm like, oh, oh, no. So then I have to pass my the exit, the only exit that I know, and then every exit's Improvise. blocked off for like miles. miles. And then I don't know what to do. So the first opportunity I get, I get off the freeway, I backtrack, and I start driving along the freeway. Okay, okay I'm, and then I make it back to the hotel like I don't know, twenty or thirty minutes late. And so Sensei's out front of the hotel waiting. And then he opens the door, the, the, the people get out, they go inside the hotel, and then Sensei Unloads. goes off on me. Why are you driving so slow? You know, and just all these things. And I was just like, and I was like, I don't know my way around downtown. I, and, and, and this person started driving all fast. And then Sensei just yelled at me and slammed the car door. And I just drove home, and I was like so mad. I was mad at the person for who I was following because he drove really fast and, and then I got lost. I was mad because Sensei wouldn't listen to my point of view. And so I went home and I remembered all the places that Sensei likes to go for dinner. So I got the phone book, 
you know, which people don't do anymore. I got the phone book out. I got the Thomas guide out. And then I drew these maps. And then before um, smartphones, you had a file of facts, a day planner. Oh, yeah. sure. I made I made all these mini maps with the always with the um, mountains to the north. So that in the moment, I could open it up and go, and go, okay, now I know how to, and then with all the exits and all these, for every restaurant that he liked to go to, you know, because I was so, like, Didn't mad. Didn't want to be caught out again. Yeah, yeah, that I got in trouble. And, of course, you know, I don't think Fru Sensei ever said he was sorry to me in the the 17 years that I was a student. So the next morning when I come to the dojo for training with these visitors, he goes, oh, take me to the hotel. And they're driving to the hotel, and he goes, that darn person, they know you don't know your way around downtown. They're driving like that. You know, he's like, what an idiot. But he didn't say, like, I'm sorry, I got mad at you. Yeah. Right. Say a sideways apology. Yeah. Around about. But the, but the thing is, is that that forced me to go, like, I'm going to get better. Right. And so I made, like, you know, tw- 10 or 20 maps. And then I have them on my, 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 my day planner that fold out. So I don't recall ever actually looking at the map again because my mind it, it works more is more visual. Mm-hmm. So once I made the map, I understood the map, and then I could remember you the map in my it. mind. Yeah, you kind of studied the route. But that's the level which you had to go through. And then after that, every time for instance you say, "Can you drive me to some place?" I would make one of those maps. And like I said, I never used it after when I got in the car. Right. And but one time it was I should. Process. But was- one time I should have used it. But it's, it was the process of making it which enabled me to understand how how you would get to that place and get back. Mm-hmm. But it was just it was just funny that in that moment when sense is going off on me, you know, like I had to go home and either get mad back, and then you know just be mad at him or say I'm going to become better. Yeah, and then make these maps. Which remember the 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 the, the incident is not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. But I still took ownership. Of my own inability, inability to know where I am, and then I made these maps, right? Right, and so that's the thing that the training kind of teaches you. And so I'm not really sure if you know if you don't learn these lessons in a stressful environment, or from a smiting, or from a slap, or from a hit, how are you going to learn them? Because yeah. you have to go home and go, oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was that other person's fault, but then how can I become better? Because most people just go home and they just blame that other person, and they go to sleep, and they just blame that other person, and then they never become better. I wanted to become better, and I know I have this shortcoming, so I had to do something. The only about thing, it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, mean, those I think maps. that that's that's the process of training, which is you 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 come you know, proverbially you come every day, you have you you try to get better, you fail, and hopefully you reflect on your failure. And you, and it's an iterative process. You you look at your failure, you try to find the solution, you implement it, you fail again, and you keep getting better and better and better over time. And as you say, the 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 stress, um, especially in a place like this, uh, pressure tests you uh, for the, the these potentially even bigger stresses in your life, whether it's family or work or illness, and. I think that, that that goes very much to what Miriam's saying because, um, like you said, you, it helped you prepare and be the kind of person that could go on and take ownership of your education. Uh, I know from talking to people in my own family that when, when they hear the kind of you know, commitment that I've had to Aikido, they're like, my God, you've done that for you know, decades and you've committed to doing that. The, the training itself... Um, does really change your life and uh if you do it for a long time i think that that process i think for like for the three of us that process is now it, it's it's completely integrated into your life like you, you can if you do it for 20 or 30 years um and you work at it it can't but help to have a huge influence on your life and that's true but the hard part is that you have people that they think that they go well i got this power now and they go, I'm out of here. And then when they leave, like, it was really interesting. Like, when Furu Sensei died, all these people came to me and, and quit. But before, when they came to me, they would tell me these stories about how Furu Sensei was this guiding light or mm. Furu Sensei was this preventative measure. 
and then they said like now that he's gone like, they don't they don't need him they don't they don't have they don't it. have it anymore. Oh, it becomes yeah, a crutch no, I, I understand that i mean what i was th- the other thing i was thinking other than the consideration for people when i when i read miriam's question is i think that the greatest power of aikido or or any traditional martial art is strength through humility you because so like in my in my job as a corporate lawyer which is a sharp elbowed very eco driven world people are like birds with colorful feathers everyone's like ah you know i'm better than you i'm bigger than you i've got a, you know i could i could say all kinds of colorful things which i won't because it's a family broadcast but people are you know they're always getting big and puffed out and bumping into each other to try to assert their their dominance and i think that one of the things that a long long-term study of a martial art like aikido is strength and humility you, you, if you stay in it long enough, you will become strong but humble. That's that. That is one aspect. Another aspect it would be that you learn to let go of. I don't know if the, what the right word would be. Where like, um, so like, like my son's really shy. Hmm. So every, every day we walk to school, we see all these kids, and they always say, "Hi, Michael," and he and he just looks away, and I go, "Hey, you can't do that." Right. I said, for one, if you do that, you could create a problem where there is no problem. I said, two, I said, the person who says hello first wins, is more dominant. Mm -hmm. So you should say hello first. But that's something you learn in martial arts. Right. If you have to go, good morning, sensei, if if the sensei says good morning and you go, good morning, you're going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So you have to to try to say good morning before the the teacher. You have to win. Yeah, you have to try to win. And with the right energy, too. With the right energy. So, like, they say that the when the, when called, you have to say, hi, and then come in, immediately. immediately. But the amount of time between being called and saying hi is roughly about how much ego you have. So, if you never answer, that's a lot of ego. Mm-hmm. If, you, if, they, if they go, Mike, and you go, hi, hi, <laughs> hi lots of ego. Right. Right? Hi, or... The space between right. being called and high, you know, and then so that's you know that's the hard part that if you if the sensei goes you know David and you go hi, you know that person got a problem, right? And then a problem ensues. But if you go Dave hi, right? And then you're you know but you see like I sat up and I yeah looked, you're ready to you're, take action, I, right? But that you can't just be walking like when we were Doshu came to San Mateo up north. And I was walking, and someone said, Ito Sensei. I went, hi. I turned around, like, right away. And it was a friend of mine, right? But, like, if I go, Dave, Ito Sensei, David, David Ito, hey, you, hey. And then they got to come up and tap you on the shoulder. That's not good. How, as a martial artist, you're not paying attention. Right. But the person was like, Ito Sensei. I was like, hi. And, like, I immediately turned around to show that I I heard it, and I'm, who who is this person? Right. You're ready. But if you go, you know, Ito Sensei. Ito sensei, hi. Or I just turn around. What? <laughs> you you, well, you lost is, your training. What I, what I was trying to connect this to is when you were saying when Owen, our teacher, for instance, they passed away, that a lot of people felt like they were attached to his personality rather than than Aikido. Well, they are, but they also he's the excuse. Oh, I see. What you're he's saying. the excuse. Like one person. He was the excuse why he wasn't. They could stop training. Well, not not stop training, but he's the excuse where he can now he now he was, wants to cheat on his wife, and, and for instance, he knew would would not approve would, would of that. It, yeah, I understand. And so you're like, like, wait, what? If, if for instance they found out he, he would that he would completely crush them. Yeah. Right. And now that he's gone, like they the, had license to do whatever. Yeah, the they training wanted. wheels are off, right? right? And you think. That seems ridiculous. You're a middle-aged man. Using right? a teacher as a crutch? Not a crutch. It's it, you. A you, barrier, almost. Yeah, that you know. I, or Fru Sensei is the person that got me to come to class every day. Right. Even when I didn't want to. Now that he's gone. I don't. You know, golfing seems like a better idea. Yeah. But it's so interesting when I look at all these people's lives who are no longer part of this dojo, and some of them don't do aikido. Majority of them don't do aikido anymore. Their training was like, and they became really, really strong good. performers. And then now in their regular life, 
Yeah. And that's where that, that thing is, is that you can't develop yourself in Aikido, but then not develop yourself in the regular life. Most people, don't, they, have, they don't have one or the other. It's, it's usually both. the same. Yeah. Right? And then so when you see someone that's not developed in their regular life, you have to, the first thing you want to ask is, oh, what's going on with their training? And then there's a training kind of suspect. Like I know one Shihan where every time I see a picture of him, he's drunk. Mm. And then I saw a picture of him the other day, and everyone in the picture is wearing a hakama. And there's obviously after class, and he's not wearing a hakama anymore. He's just wearing a his black belt. Like he took off his hakama, and then you go, oh, you got to take the take a picture. Oh, okay. And you think, wow, interesting. What? Or like one time I was at this gashuku, and these teachers from Japan came and. At the end of the class, they they brought out a gift for the teacher of, who, of the dojo. And the teacher of the dojo had already taken off his uniform, and it was just in his bottoms, his, his, his zubo and his pants. And they go, oh, so, and he comes running out without his shirt on, not running out of the dressing room. He just comes running forward with his shirt off to receive this gift, this formal gift. And I'm like, Wow! What kind of per- and then and then someone brings out his his uniform and then he just holds it closed and receives the gift. But the first thing he does is run out with his top off. And you think, wow, that person's lost their etiquette. And I guess, and, and it, I think that's an old Japanese man's thing because when you go to like old, you, when you go to your, like your friends' houses, like the dad's just sitting there in his underwear, in his boxers, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> I remember one of my friends who's uh, Japanese American. She before I went to her house. Me and her fiance, she's like, I just want to let you know that my dad sits around in his underwear and don't be. And I go, oh, he's old Japanese style, huh? <laughs> <laughs> just gets down to the most comfortable barrier, right? He says, and he was just sitting there, just in his whitey tidies, his tidy whiteies, and I was all, and I was like, oh, and so I talked to him, you know, smoothing it over for my Caucasian buddy, to, so he can marry funny. his Japanese American daughter. But that's that thing that that you lose that edge to know, like, oh. They're probably going to give me a gift, so I should not change out. Right, right. I should probably, you know, and that's why, like, I'd always admonish you guys, like, don't fold your hakamas first. Right. Always look around to see if there's a something going someone on. higher ranking that needs to have their hakama folded, or that. And it's not that you have to fold my hakama because I'm like the master or I'm this great person, but you're trying to demonstrate your level of, of training, training and ego. So right. if you take off your hakama, the class ends. You just automatically take take off your hakama and start folding it. You might have to fold the visiting Shihan's hakama, right. and then you're not supposed to fold it with in your day clothes. You're not supposed to fold it with your hakama half untied or your hakama off. You're trying to show that you're ready to do this, right? Right. So when you walk, you go, oh, sensei, 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 here, let me, let me, let me do that in your in your day clothes. Can't do that. You're already thinking of yourself, right? You know, like I was at a dojo on the East Coast, uh, and it was uh, a lot of dojos came together and they're all training, and, and there was a, this really old man who they introduced, and he had been an Aikidoist since like the early '60s. And at the end of the, he didn't teach a class; he ju- they just announced him because he's such a you know a, high level a high level person. At the end of the class, I look over; he's just standing there holding his hakama, looking Oof. around. So I go up to him and I go, "Sensei, may I fold your hakama?" And this person goes, "No!" From across the dojo, runs pushes me out of the way and grabs the hakama, yanks the hakama out of this old man's hand, and then gives me like this look and then starts folding it. But then this person also was not wearing the hakama anymore. Right. But then that person, was that person showing his level? No. Yeah, this person definitely showing their well, level. Well, yeah, they did <laughs> show their level, <laughs> but not level. a good one. Because he pushed me out of the way. Right. Right. He tore the hakama out of the, the teacher's hand. He was already, he had folded his own hakama. Yeah. But like, and then, you know, that gives me this bad look, like, how dare I try to fold those guys' hakama? It's like, man, you're the one who already changed out your hakama. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, if this would have been 1990, I would have just punched the guy in the face. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's 2000-something, and I just go, yeah, whatever. It's not my That's dojo. kind of, I mean, it, 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 I've been thinking of this question for the last, like, 20, 30 minutes, and it kind of, this maybe it's a good time to ask the question. What... What are the pitfalls from your perspective as a teacher, or maybe yours too, Mike, as a teacher? What are the pitfalls that make it hard for a student, maybe who's been in the dojo for a couple of years, to make their their daily life um, 
parallel to their training life in the dojo? What do you think are the 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 common, you know, the, cracks in the in the in the sidewalk? I would say the two cracks. One is complacency, and one is realism, for lack of a better word. Realism. Realism. Mm-hmm. So complacency is that you become complacent. Oh, it's not. It's not Sensei or Ito Sensei, it's David or Dave. When I was younger, everybody called me Dave, but now I'm David, right? I don't even go by Dave anymore, but so many people call me Dave, it's ridiculous. You know, but like, it's that common, that that you become complacent because you no longer, there's no longer an edge. Okay. Right? And there's, the dojo, this dojo doesn't have an enforcer anymore. But in the 90s and through thousands, we had enforcers. Right, one time there was a guy in the middle of the warm up that Fru Sensei came down and did the warm up. In the middle of the warm up, this guy let out this huge belch, Burp! like that. And I and why I did that, I was like, I'm gonna murder this person. And I murdered that person in the class. All right, but like, there's no enforcer, so there's no one that keeps that edge. There's no, there's no hill. There becomes no hill to climb. They go, right. oh, that's just good old Mike. Oh, he's got. Um, a messed up wrist i don't just crank that wrist in my day if they found out you had like a bad wrist they cranked the hell out of it and, and so you we never wore tape or red no. stripe on our uniform because never that, did that showed that person Where to attack the yeah. person mm-hmm. but then in in the class i'd be like mike my shoulders are injured don't uh don't crank my shoulder or he would already know i won't crank this guy's shoulder right because there were people on the mat that would say oh your shoulder's messed up okay so, then, so complacency is one. Just keep it on the down low. And the other one's real. This idea of realism. And when so I say that re- is realism. Well, realism. You you think real realism is more like Aikido being real? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about realism is that you, the real you comes out, hmm. and when the real you comes out, you go. Oh, everyone can see that I have this problem, and then it's too painful. You know, like. Gary Iliano often quotes other another Aikido teacher when he says, you bring your stuff to the mat, hmm. right? You bring your stuff to the mat, you know, it's kind of like moving meditation. Because you're doing this moving meditation, this, your underlying inside you comes out. And then that's, that I think is this, the single most reason, the biggest reason why people quit. From the day one to all day, you know, Forever. 40 years in the real you finally came out and when the real you finally came out you go i gotta get the hell out of here hmm. you know like um i always say talk about how in, during a seminar because seminars are really rigorous uh, the real you comes out the teacher the trainer uh the, the teacher the bully the 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 talker the talker the the person the real you comes out like so you, the training gets really um, rigorous, and you're like, hey, so anyways, um, <laughs> how's your wife doing? You know, you, how long are you in town for? And you're like, just train, man. Or, yeah. oh, I got injured, I got to sit out. Or, hey, go easy on me, I hurt my wrist. And you go, oh, sorry. Right. You know, or the, oh, Bill, let me tell you how to do this because you, you're not doing it right. And you're like, right. what? So the real you comes out. And so, and I, I mean, that I would say is the, probably the single biggest reason why people quit. The real you comes out. And that thing that you don't want people to know that, you know, like that you're afraid, that you're, um, you know, not physically fit or whatever it is. And so here you are in this dojo, people are throwing you down, and then you become afraid because your real you comes out, and then you go, I got to get out of here. Yeah. But it also, it, it seems to me that the, the, the concept of realism is also necessary for your development. Well, yeah. I mean, Fruisense, like we bring it back to that story about Fruisense getting mad at me. He brought to light, the situation brought to light a shortcoming. Right. That I don't know, I'm, I'm bad with poor th- with directions. So I could have just run away and be like, oh, shoot, people know? How embarrassing. Quit. Right. But instead I said, I got to fix this shortcoming somehow. There's no, there's going to be no way I figure out what's north or, or south or west intrinsically. Right. You got to find a, a, I have to a come method. Up with a, I, have hack. To, I have to come up with a hack. <laughs> but hacks are just shortcuts, right? Yeah. But that's one of those those shortcomings I don't know if you can fix. You won't be able to intuitively you know, spin you around with your eyes closed and you go, that's north. Right. Some people have that. Yeah. I think this guy has it. 
right? Watanabe Sensei has that. He's really good with directions, but I I'm not, right? So I had to come up with this this method this method to fix that shortcoming. And so when the real you comes out, you know, you realize every you think that everyone realizes that you're out of shape. Now we all know you're out of shape. But then when you realize it, you go, oh, I got to get out of here. When you when you say like, so, so for you, like I think all three of us, pro- whoops, all three of us probably have certain hacks that allow us to make our lives um, parallel to our training. Um, I'm curious if 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 we if Miriam were here, what what advice or um, lessons could we impart having i mean if we combine the years of training between the three of us we're probably getting close to a hundred hundred years of training between the three of us uh, what what could we impart to miriam and people who are wanting to know the answer to this question um to to uh, instruct really well i would say it, it really comes down to two things face it and then ask yourself, what is on the other side of that? Hmm. So if you face it, l- let's say um, you get injured, which is one of the reasons why people quit. And then you think, I don't want to have a bad back my whole life. And then you think to yourself, oh, how do I face this? Is that true? Will I have, I mean, ev- does everybody here have a bad back? Right. You know, and then you go, maybe what I think is not true. So when you, f- you first have to face it, you can't run away from it and then, and then kind of think, well, what if, if that line of thinking was true? So confront your, your problem. Confront whatever's coming up. And then as you face it, you ask yourself, but what's on the other side of this? So evaluate it, look, look past it. Yeah. So when you look past it, you think, is it true that I'm going to have a bad low back for the rest of my life? I mean, it could be true. And then you survey all the other students and go, you got a bad back? No, my back's fine. You think, well, all these other people don't have a bad back. Well, maybe if I did some core strengthening exercises or different stretches, I would improve my, my back pain. Right. As opposed to, I might, I might be injured for the rest of my life with a and bad back. Out of fear. And I better quit, which happens all the time. I get these emails, hey, I, I hurt my back, and the doctor advises me not to do Aikido, so I'm going to quit. And I go, but you've been only doing Aikido like 30 days, my man. Right. Like, you gotta, you, you're using muscles you never knew you had. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, but then they can't, they've already made up their mind. But then that may, that may not even be the reason why they quit. No, that's just the excuse they gave themselves. Right. To out themselves. Yeah, their, 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 their validation, justification. Mm-hmm. Well, so that, that's an interesting, you're bringing up an interesting thing, which is, the, the, the phenomenon that, that all martial arts, not just Aikido, all martial arts struggle with students that join, and then we've talked about the arc of people that stay in. For What is the, the, the first hurdle in time that people face in terms of... I would think the first hurdle in training is I didn't think this would be like this. You watch, you type in Aikido on YouTube, and you're like, whoa, she's throwing this guy down. He's throwing that guy, whoa, that's some wild techniques. I want to do that. And then you get here. And it's not like that. Well, not only that, not only can you not do it, but then you forget that you have to receive that. And then some <laughs> person throws you down a little too hard, and you're like, whoa, you're like, what no, the hell no, is I don't this? Like that. This is not what I thought it would be. I had, I had a guy come into a class uh, to join. He goes, yeah, I've read everything about Aikido, watched all these videos. He's just like, Raw, raw. He's like, like I, I, I want to do it. Aikido. He didn't last a week. So, what is the normal time frame for the f- the first hurdle? Would you say is it thirty days? Uh, less, than 30 days. Less, yeah, than 30 less than thirty days. Less than thirty days. Right. So you have all these different hurdles. You have to get over what you think Aikido is or is not. You have to get over your first injury. You have to get over your first rough treatment. There's all these firsts. Right. Right. You know, and like those are really hard to deal with because like, like I said, you, you came here and someone twisted the heck out of your wrist on the very first day. Right. And that person, you know, was having a bad day. And they also set false expectations of themselves and then they realize they're not meeting them. Yeah. Well, so what kind of false expectations do you mean? I'm going like? to get this good by this time. It's like, how do you know? You oh. never trained. Yeah. yeah. So they create these, I need to, I need to do, be able to do this by this time and they don't reach it. Yeah. So, but they're false expectations because they're not based on reality. Yeah, I I run marathons and do uh, dance, so I should be able to pick this up no problem. <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> I don't think I can do this. And you go, 
that you think of because it's not the same thing. Aikido uses your whole body. Yeah, yeah. So if that's the case, and you're you're the chief instructor, Mike and I are, are assistant instructors with you know probably ninety years of experience. The three of us. What what could we say to Miriam and and other students that are coming up in the ranks to to help students? get their lives and their training on a parallel track. What is the best thing that we could impart? One, just them? practice. You, well, you got to just practice, which is the hardest thing to do. But the thing is, is that it's the seniors, not the teacher's job, the seniors to call the juniors. So you have to have your, your finger on the pulse of that person to go, whoa, 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 don't quit. Wait, 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 you're going to quit? Meet me for coffee. Right, and then you talk to them, and then you, they go, and, you know, they're telling you some story about their back pain and all this stuff, and then as you talk to them, they go, well, but I'm just afraid that I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life, and you go, all right, that's the real problem, and then you talk them back into the dojo. So what you're talking about is the community. It's the community. Mm -hmm. The community, of the dojo, is self-regulating, self-supporting. Yeah, because the thing is that in my day there wasn't a very good community. It was it was Furia Sensei, the senior, and then everyone else was on the same right. plane. No one took care of each other. In fact, it was Gladiator's Arena. Yeah, it was kill, kill or be killed. Everyone just beat the crap out of each other, and then and then whoever was in trouble, everyone like, yeah. <laughs> don't be anywhere near that guy. They, they yeah. called it the doghouse. Oh, yeah. I'm in the doghouse right now. Right. Furia Sensei hasn't spoke to me in three months. Right. So I'm not, I'm not really sure what the advice is, because it's not something that happens right away. Right. It's something that it's a practice so like you know for instance um i didn't graduate from high school right and so i didn't really understand how to study i didn't really understand how to uh, i didn't have any of the skills you would need to go to higher education so when i went into junior college you didn't have to, those days i don't know if it changed today but in those days you didn't have to have a college uh, high school education so i inserted myself into into junior college in those days you had to take all these um tests so when I test took all these tests, I based on those tests is where they place you in, in English, classes, math, right. and I placed in the you know in the middle. And they said, "Oh, you could start here." And I said, "No, I want to start at the very basic." Hmm, and they're like, "You don't have to though." I go, "I want to." So I started with my, in math, arithmetic <laughs> was the class. The class was called arithmetic. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So from there all the way into calculus and all that type of stuff. But I didn't have to. But I said, no. Based on what I learned in martial arts, you must start with the basics. Start with the basics. Kihon Waza, basics. I need to establish the basics first. Right. You know, and so I just went back and, and started with the basics. But the thing is, is that, like, there is it starts to – see how, like, it starts – your life starts to parallel in the training. Right. But then I'd already been studying Aikido for maybe a year or so. So what you're talking about there, that's really interesting to me. You're, what you're saying is, is you took – really like almost like an algorithm like a method from martial arts and you're like that method makes a lot of sense to me that you have to have a foundation and then from the foundation you can build the the frame and then you can put on the frame you can put the walls and the and, and everything and but the, it's that the foundation itself is is the bottom and what you build on and then from there, you, you can go up and up from there. I think that's really interesting. That's great advice, I think, because um, people, and I, I've seen this in my own career, people want to jump to the higher level as fast as they can. And in martial arts, especially Aikido, and especially our school, we emphasize the basics all the way through. Like, even at a high level, you're always repeating the basics. And... Um, my understanding of the way we teach is even when we do advanced techniques, they're really just um, the basics reinterpreted. The, the basics probably done faster or mm. yeah. fast. Yeah, uh, and that's a really that's a super interesting story to me because that that's something that all of us can apply in almost anything that you do. Anything that you do well, if you can get the foundation right, you probably can do the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, even my Japanese teacher, who I've been with for years, and I'm not just like the worst student, I always go, you know, let's start back at the beginning. She's like, no, we're not going to start back at the beginning. And I'm like, nah, I'd rather just start back at the beginning, you know, not because I want it to be easy, it's because I want to develop a better foundation. Right. But that's that thing where you have to, you know, like, 
you get this moxie, this matitude, right? To, right? This matitude that you get from training that enables you to walk walk into a place and not have be afraid that you're going to get beaten up. Right. But that same moxie is that uh, or matitude enables you to go, you know what? This is not working in my life and I'm going to change it. Right. And then you try to change it, right? So like for me, <clears throat> once I I started in Aikido, then once I achieved black belt, I realized I could you could do anything you want if you set your mind to right. it and then you create a you create a plan. Right. And so like when when I finally you know it got through all the classes and was ready to um, matriculate to a four-year university they go oh you need to have a high school uh, diploma or a GED, GED or something and I went oh shoot <laughs> so then they have these classes you could take that you take to to prepare you for the GED and I went no I'm not gonna take that I'm just gonna go right in and if I fail this thing I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning and of course, I didn't fail the GED, right? right? I got like a really high score on it, but I'd already been in college for like you know Couple eight years. years or something like that. Yeah. So it's like in my mind it was like, no, I've already established a, a high a, level, a of high education. level of, of ability. And the, but I said to myself, if I fail it, I'm going all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. You know. I look. I think this is great advice uh, and and insight for both beginners and for advanced level people because. Uh, every at every step in your life, you're always starting something new in in some sense. Yeah, you're starting a new job or a new day. Yeah, I mean, a new job, new life, new relationships, new location. Retirement is a new step. Everything that you do has some component of novelty to it, and 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 having a control of the basics, whatever it is, um, creates, as you say, confidence. You're calling it matitude, but it creates confidence, which allows you to tackle problems um, without panic, uh, without uncertainty. Without judgment. Well, yes. then it, and it's also like what you're saying, that humility. Yes. So you, you wake up in the morning. Like if we just said that every day you would remake your day from the beginning, you wake up in the morning, you look over at your significant other who you were arguing with, and then you go, I'm going to let it go. Right. And start this whole day anew. You say, "Hey, I'm sorry about yesterday. Let's start the whole day anew." Right. Most people they don't have that humility. They hold the they grudge. Go, like get this it's, person. It's like doing those sales calls, and then you just like pull off a full on zero. It's like <laughs> shake it off. Don't don't let it anchor you to the past. Absolutely. You know what? The next sale is it's a different different presentation, a different group of people. For you know, forget the old and just move on and try to be better the next time. Well, that's 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 the thing is that martial arts is this study and how to make yourself the best you can make yourself right yeah. so if you're an artist you've been doing some art and you're not not getting anywhere you go i'm going back to the beginning right and then you learn about color you learn about this you learn about techniques and then you go and then you reintegrate it and then hopefully it it the when you, when you reintegrate it into the whole the whole is better yeah right but that's the hard part is that you have to it's all it's all a mind game Right, staying, leaving, getting good, getting not good. As my as my little brother always says, when he goes, man, I went to Thailand. And they teach um, uh, monkeys how to ride motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever we go, I go, man, it, it could be hard. He goes, dude, I've been in Thailand. They teach they teach monkeys how to drive motorcycles. Is you know analogous <laughs> to saying that you could anyone could learn this, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and to me, Aikido is just physical movement, right? Right. If you walked in here, you can learn martial arts. Right. But the hard part is that your ego or your mind gets in the way right. and says, oh, I shouldn't be here. It starts coming up with all these um, excuses for why you probably shouldn't do this. Oh, man, Monday Night Football's on. Oh, this uh, the Dodgers are in the, in the playoffs. Oh, I got to, you know, I need to take the day off. And then when you start saying that, I need to take the day off, I need to do this thing, they start to layer Right. And then you go, man, I haven't been Aikido in two months. It becomes and a then, malaise. And then most people don't have the humility to just come right back. Right. They go, well, I guess I'm never going back there. Right, right. You know? Well, that's, that, that to me, um, the strength with humility is one of the best rewards from the long-term practice. Because every time you step on the mat, um, the practice uh, humbles you, even if you get really strong. Because... It's practice is difficult. Even even if you're doing basics for thirty years, you're going to learn something in every class. You always will, 
And if you can be open to that that learning, um, that will humble you, even if it makes you, and it will make you stronger. But the practice is always a challenge. It always is. And if you have a good teacher, which we have here, you will consistently put in, be put in a place where you have the opportunity to learn. And I think that that's one of the best things about Aikido is that often if you're like in my job I have the opportunity to learn all the time because I'm constantly getting new tasks but a lot of people in their jobs don't have the opportunity to learn their their jobs are repetitive or they're stuck in a job where they do the same thing for five years so if you come to Aikido your body and your mind are engaged in learning forever and and that is something that you know, and, and looking at the quote that I think is something that we we might overlook, which is we're in a learning environment, yeah, and that engages all the, time. all the time, and that engages your mind and your body for the your entire life. And there's nothing more important for the development of your healthy brain than learning. Yeah, and so let's say you're in this dead end job, you go, I get this job stinks, sucks, and then you go, you know what? I'm going to change it. I learned it. in Aikido that you can achieve anything you want. And then you see something and you go, I'm going to do that. Right. You know, and then you go and do it. But that's the hard part. Like you, it's not Aikido. It's not me. It's not the dojo. It's not, you know. It's, it's the principles. It's the training. Right. Which gives you this power to tackle the obstacles in your life. And that, you know, there are stories where, you know, like I said, that person was a bus driver and then went on became to become a lawyer. Became a lawyer. Right, but I know people that um, were were they were in a dead end relationship. The person was a little bit abusive, and they went, you know what? No, right, not having that. And they they broke up with that person, and then started a, started a different life, right? But like, the hard part is that you have to have the awareness that this is not working, right? Not to, not not from an Aikido sense, but that, and I want to become better, right? And because I want to become better, then I need to figure out a way to become better. But then something inside of you goes, you know what? That other day, I couldn't fall down very well in Shihonage, but now I can. Maybe I can take that principle and apply it to my regular life because as I work on this thing, I'll get better at it. Just right. like I worked on that thing in the dojo and got better at it. Oh, there it is the same. Oh, then how do I make myself better? How do I draw better? How do I take better pictures? How do I... How do I do this job which I don't want to be in, but I have to be in? Right. You know, it's a family business. I can't just quit. Well, but then I can try to find some way to do it better, some way to have more joy while I do it. Yeah, I remember. You, I'm sure you know this because we you were talking about driving. I remember I used to, I didn't drive Sensei a lot, but I drove him. And I remember sometimes when we would go to Pasadena or Alhambra for um, – Persian, um, not Persian, but um, Islamic, Chinese, Islamic food. Chinese food, that sensei often did not want to take the same route to um, the same place sometimes. And, and I remember he said to me um, that you don't want to take the same route because people will be able to track you. But the, what I thought about it was that um, in learning – uh, you don't want to take the same route because that routinizes your brain. Yeah. So, like, if you go to work the same way every time, then sometimes when you go to drive and you're not going to work, you may take the route to work when you're just not thinking because you've routinized your brain. Yeah. Been there, done that. We've all done <laughs> it, I'm sure. But, you know, with Sensei talking about don't take the same way every time you do something, it keeps you from routinizing your brain. So, it allows you to continually learn and, and train your mind and that's what I think is just so fascinating about um, Aikido is that uh, you know one of the things that um, Second Doshu said was he said that Aikido has like infinite number of techniques like if you train long enough and you become advanced enough and you you get exposed to like your teaching um, there is there really is this infinite opportunity to learn um, technique um, perseverance strength um and it's unfortunate as you say that the people quit early because the rewards come when you're in there for a long time yeah and then most people don't have that much time but if you think about it what, what you're talking about is that you want to f constantly be looking for a different route right because let's say you're a lawyer right and you got good at being a lawyer you can't you don't want to just become like a different type of lawyer you like, but if you were tr 
try to be, you know, like you're in your sense, trying to learn Japanese, that you could still take that formula, but the formula will have to change a little bit because it's a language, right? Right, and then you you have to, you have to come up with go well, and then you you assess yourself and you think I'm just not good with uh, visual learning, right. so then you you re heavily rely on auditory, or I'm not really good auditory, so then I rely more on visual, visual or something. Right. You try to find a different way to the top of the mountain, and then that, and then that's where it becomes like this idea where, for lack of a better word, a winning attitude. Because right. you're always trying to get to the top of whatever you do. Like, yeah. I always say to my wife, I could never be homeless. If I was, I'd be like the boss of the homeless people, right? <laughs> you know, I could never work at McDonald's. I would be the manager within six months. Right. Right, because I have that drive and that desire to learn and and make things faster, right? You right. know, like I always try to set up a process. So, you know, when I used to work at this country club, I'd have to uh, um, input these tickets, and most people, it took them like four hours to do the tickets. But I set up a process and jigged it all up to where I could get the whole thing done in an hour. Wow. And then people didn't like it when I did that because then they couldn't just meander Be slow through four hours. Hour. And here I am like with this whole jigged up process, bam, 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 bam. And they're like, oh, but you probably do it and you get all these mistakes. I never had a mistake. And But it was this thing. I set, I set it up. I jigged it so that... It was all ready to go. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and all you know. But like most people don't have that, right? Like when some of those people used to do those tickets, they would just do the tickets. I would put them all in member order number first, so that I would. I, it was easier for me to input the the member number one one five seven mm -hmm. one five six one five instead of having to like go one two four three fruit. You know, but like most people just just did it as they came, and then they would they would it would cut require them to do yeah. do it for too long but that's that idea is that everything you do you're trying to come up with a process an idea and a way to make it better and faster not because you're trying to become um to get through it is a, it, but as a challenge oh i can't i can't do this ukemi as a challenge i'm going to try to do it yeah i mean this this is um i mean you and i have talked about this because i I've, I've been reading um uh, one of Jigoro Kano's books, and he talks about, and I think it's somewhat applicable to Aikido, it's not the same, but he talks about how, you know, the, the main principle in Judo is uh, maximizing efficiency um, and, and and how to make that work through your entire life. And there's, there's some aspect to that in Aikido in the sense that um, if you correlate your life with your training, you want to um, you want to use your energy in the best way possible. Yeah. And I think that, that in that sense, Judo and Aikido are very similar because Aikido is about harnessing and using power um, in, in the most collaborative, best way. And um, I think at one point, Kano Sensei sent stu of his, some of his students to Supposedly, train yeah. with Aikido. Because he recognized um, this very unique way that Aikido trained, um, and I think that you know we're very lucky to be able to train in this in this particular martial art because of, of the way that um, O Sensei and Second Doshu really established this particular way of training. And that's this idea that why don't Aikidos compete? Why don't they do MMA? Why don't they have competitions? And that's just one of those distractions, right? Because the real the real opponent you're trying to overcome is yourself. Right. Right? And so when Frida Sensei yells at me, I could just blame that other person or blame him or I could try to overcome myself. And so every time you meet an obstacle, it's there to help you. Right. You know, like if you can't take this, you're too afraid to take this, forward, this style of forward roll – you go, all right, I'm yeah, going to confront and, this and then, and do then it. try to do it. And then as you desensitize yourself, you go, oh, well, and you look back, you go, oh, it wasn't really anything anyways. Right. You know, like the way I take a koshinage now is not the way I took it for the longest time. But now I do this whole like snaking thing where my body just goes over completely nice and I never get hurt. Right. But the old days I would do it a different way and I always got hurt. Right. Right. But like the, this, that's that idea that you, you first got to over – you first have to – identify or, or accept that this thing is happening 
So let me ask you a question. You're, t- you're, you're talking, I think, like, you were using uh, Koshinage Ukemi as a good example. Um, I think a lot of us, when we used to do Koshinage uh, Ukemi style, I mean, Furia Sensei had a way of teaching it um, through a, a step-by-step process, but I think the old style of taking uh, Koshinage Ukemi was very judo-like. It was kind of like you just get flopped over. Yeah. Um, and you're talking a more of a, a harmonizing uh, yeah. style of Ukemi. Which is in some ways more advanced. It's like it's, you know, in in the earlier style, it's just more to like the person who grabs you and, yeah, flops you, throws you any which way. Um, trying to harmonize more with it um, is a more advanced style of ukemi and r- requires more concentration. Yeah, and the, but that's that everything we we've been talking about. This idea of harmonizing, right? It's happening. How can I harmonize with it? Yeah, I mean that's what I wanted to try to get at. Is is that's why I was bringing up Kano versus uh, Osensei. Is is that they both both martial arts are forms of jujitsu. I mean, if you go back, back. But what I think is interesting about our training is this emphasis on harmonization. Um, well, it's not that the emphasis of harmonization. You have to realize that like. A lot of these Aikido teachers in the past didn't make it to the level that we're at today because you're standing on the shoulder of giants. In order for Aikido to become established, you need a guy who's super rough and just beats everyone up. Right. Because then that establishes the reputation and the, the creates the groundwork for this. Right. And then as, yeah. as we move away from that, we don't need to establish ourselves as a martial art. Well, at least I don't. And then, so then, I can think about me as an as a human being, right? Right. But these other people, you know, uh, pre-war Aikidoists and whatever, they don't have the opportunity to think about: Am I a better person? Should I be a better person? They got to survive, mm-hmm. right? So once you're done surviving, you go, okay, now this time it's, it's the time to thrive. So then, how can I make myself into a better person? And that's why you look at some of these old school um, Aikido teachers that are here or gone. They never developed past the physical level of Aikido. But that's because they weren't able to, because the the situation didn't warrant that. If you open the refrigerator and there's no food in the refrigerator, you got to get some food for that refrigerator. Right. You can't worry about if you're a good person or not. But if you open up that refrigerator and there's a ton of food in there, then you could work on a, a bigger problem. Right. But right now, the most immediate problem for those people, pre-war people or older Aikido, was, was to establish themselves physically. But sensei, I mean, just just looking at at the, the three of us. I mean, you're a little bit earlier than me, and Mike's a couple years earlier than me. But all three of us went through, and it's it's not really happening for students from now. But all three of us went through a rough training phase. I think. Yeah. I mean, maybe not as bad as pre war Aikido, but the three of us went through, a you know, training by fire. I mean, we uh-huh. we had the we had the kill or be killed training for 10, 10 years or more, uh, which is not as available for students coming up in the ranks now. And so what I think you're alluding to is that we had that hard training also, but then we're also trying to work on ourselves. Right. But if you look at 95% of the people from the past in this dojo for the last 30 years, they didn't make it. Right. Some of them you talk to and you go, wow, that guy's 60 something years old, still trying to fight people in the street. Right, dude, you gotta calm that. You gotta calm down. Right, right. Even me, I'm like 51, and I, I'm still like I should punch that person in the right. face. And I'm like, oh, I gotta calm down, right. man. <laughs> well, I think all three of us probably you know. Mike, I don't know if speak for you, Mike, but I know I don't know myself. There are definitely times when I want to unload on someone, and you're right. You're like you, you're like oh shit. I but see, in the old days, you just went, would do they it. They go, oh, I just unload on that person. Right. In the old days, when someone couldn't take a forward roll well. You'd kill him. No, we just sensei sensei himself would call that person up in front of the class and throw that person fifty times. I know. Yeah. And we called it beating it out of them. Right. He's got to beat it out of them. Right. Oh, you don't like to take cushion? I'll just beat it out of you. Right. But then you're not taking into account that person. Right. And if you maybe just spoke to them with your words and said, "What's what's the problem?" Oh, he said, "Well, here, let's get out the red mat and let's work on it." Mm-hmm. And right. then you help that person. Well, that's something that I really noticed that's such a change and a positive change. Like um, like Blair, who's a new student r- right now, um, she comes early and works on her roles. And people help her, like Eric helps her and uh, John, you, and she'll come early to class, pull out the red mat, 
well, she's actually progressed past the red map, but we'll work on her roles before class, work on her roles after class. And um, that's something I've noticed as a change from the birth by fire that we went through, where um, senior students are like stepping in and helping her to roll. And you're like, wow, like that's. But the, the thing that. is, is are you robbing them of their, of finding the way out on their own? It's so possible. Like, the red mat is a, is a very good symbolic thing for that. Right, like, I go, hey, uh, Miriam, you want to use the red mats to work on that role? No, I don't want to do that. But I shouldn't even have asked her, right. because I'm, I possibly by doing that, I'm shortchanging her experience. Experience. So the old days, they went, oh, you don't want to roll? They threw you fifty times, and then you at the after you hit your head ten times, your mind clicked off, and your body just moved, uh, and then you st you started to roll better. I remember this is how crazy it was in the beginning because we had the hard mats. We had the real tatami mats in the old dojo. Yeah. And I remember when I first joined in 93 or 94, when I started law school, um, the first month here, I had bruises on my lower back. Literally, like dark bruises from being thrown so hard. Yeah. Um, I call them the soft spots because every time you'd roll, you feel them. <laughs> and I was like, and I looked in the mirror, I was like, my back really hurts. Like, Right, but then you said to yourself, I, I have gotta to learn. fix that. I gotta learn how to roll right. You gotta mm -hmm. fix that. Because I'm not the only one that this is happening to. I'm the only one that this is happening to, so then everyone must have figured it out already. Yeah. So that's that thing. Because you 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 apply that I the, the desire to improve yourself right. to that problem. Yeah. The and you learn that in the dojo. So you take your training, your Aikido your Aikido training into your daily life and you say to yourself how do I improve this thing? Right. How do I improve this process? How do I? I'm not happy with the way my life is in this way. So how do I improve that? Yeah, and then that's how um, Aikido improve um, filters into your daily life and improves your daily life. You know, one of the students told me that he used to never wash dishes, huh. and then his wife came and to the dojo supposedly and told Frida Sensei thank you so much because now my husband washes the dishes. Oh wow! It's because before he would just put his dirty dish in the sink. And never think about it. And never think about it, because his wife washed the dishes. But then now, he sees the dirty dishes, and he can't help himself and has to help out. That's and then, great. And then now she's happier because he helps out and washes his, his dirty dish. Saved the I know. I know for me, <laughs> the, the thing that I, I remember, maybe it was, I was in the dojo a year or two years. I remember specifically, it happened, I was with Sensei somewhere. Anyways, uh, I dropped something, and since he's like, pick that up, and like he yelled at me, and ever since then, like if I ever drop anything, like I immediately think like, since he's gonna see me if I don't pick it up, and, and I never, even if it's the tiniest thing, like when I was younger, I might be like, oh, it's just a little piece of paper. Now I'm like, I, it like my whole body goes like this if I drop something. I'm like, you better pick that up and put it in the garbage can. Like you can't like not be meticulous. About like it would, I think of it more of an Iaido than an Aikido, but like since he's like, it, would a swordsman allow you to drop something and not pick it up? Like how could a swordsman do that? Like that that would be just absolutely completely inappropriate. And well, so yeah, and that but that's that thing is what now you're after Furu Sensei smited you, now it becomes intuitive and right. preemptive. Right. Right, and so you have to think. Okay, now, now it's not so much that you even think about improving your daily life; you just do it. Right, mm -hmm. you know. And so I used to have a stick shift car, and when I would drive Sensei, I noticed that you know, he, uh, 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 <laughs> and then before he said anything, I started to drive smoother, let the clutch out in a different way, so that he, there wouldn't be this back Jerky, and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so he never said, like, you better learn how to drive this thing. <laughs> I just looked over once, and then I saw him go like that, and I went, oh. Not so good. He's going to get mad at that. So I, I, I didn't. I, right. I changed the way I drove. And now I drive that same way now. But that it became preemptive. It became intuitive. Right. So that's that thing where once you start improving yourself in the dojo, you can't help but improve yourself in your daily life. Right. And then it becomes preemptive and intuitive. And then so later on, you can no longer be a, a bad lawyer. You just can't handle that. Right. You got it. I. You typed that the thing. You misspelled the. Uh, 
what was that famous one that they, they misspelled uh they misspelled this word and then it ruined everything like you go no nope. oh it was trump in one of his briefs misspelled united states yeah and then you go oh you're the guy and you go you would never do that again because it was so embarrassing painful you know like as we close this up, I'll tell you this kind of a funny story that one time I was washing down the front of the dojo and you use this hose and you, the hose doesn't have a valve on it. It's just a, a tip. And so you, you use your thumb. moderate the, the, you regulate the water pressure and the, the water, fan. the water angle, uh, angle, whatever you call that, the, the fan the, or the, the spray, the, the type of, the type of water comes out of the thing with your thumb. So I'm washing down, and I have this whole process down to, you know, I do it all the time. And these two guys walk up and are visiting the dojo. So I pipe the tip of the thing, and I'm holding it back. Pressure back, yeah. And then, you know, at that time, I'm, like, much stronger than I am now. And, like, I'm holding the pressure, and I'm talking to them, and Sensei comes out. Who are you talking to? And I go, oh, these two students are here visiting from this other, other dojo. And then Sensei goes, take them in the back, show them where to park. And he grabs the hose. Oh, no. And then, like, there's this moment where, like, we fight with the hose, and he yanks it out of my hand, and the hose goes, whoosh, and squirts him. <laughs> the guys start laughing. The guys uh, start that's laughing, That's the worst right? thing is they could be laughing. So then I, I take him to the back parking lot, and then I run back, and since he's wa- f- finishing the washout, and then he just chases me around <laughs> the parking lot with the hose trying to squirt me. And then, and then those guys laughed, right? And then because they laughed, I, oh, I beat the crap out of them. I was so mad that 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 Sensei got squirted, and that he got mad at me, and that they laughed. So I just beat the crap out of them. And then, of course, Sensei told everybody the story, and then he said, "I told everybody that story to shame you, so he would never do that again." And so now, whenever he came out and grabbed the hose, I would always point it at myself. At yourself. So that it would squirt me before it squirted him, right? But like, but that's that thing. Like you, you know. Now I know he goes to grab the hose, and then I always turn it to myself, mm-hmm. or I turn it away, of course. But then if it's like gonna squirt, I just so I'll get squirted before he gets squirted because I don't want to get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like, that's the hard part that it, Aikido can permeate into your daily life, but you have to train in order to get the power. And the, and, the, and the techniques to transfer that into your daily life. Right. You right. Develop that mindset. The, develop that mindset. You will develop a, mi- a martial artist mindset, which is a, a martial artist mindset is about continuous improvement. So like you right. said, it's a continuous learning environment. Right. You constantly be learning. You become complacent because your mind becomes complacent. You start to watch someone like Watanabe Sensei or Furu Sensei and you start looking at the movement you might become complacent, but then you go, whoa, I saw what he did with his foot. I want to try to do that. Right. And then you that's that continuous improvement. And then it can't help. Well, I guess it can because there are people that are really good at Aikido, but then our regular lives are just a you mess. Know, train wreck. Yeah, train wreck. But generally speaking, it has to permeate. It can't. You right. can't you don't go, oh, dojo dojo daily life, dojo daily life, turn your mind on and off. Like right. a guy cleaning the dishes. Yeah. You go, ah, I just can't. You know, so I mean it, it does it does permeate into your daily life, but you must train to allow that to happen. Right. When does it happen? I don't really even know. Yeah. It just becomes this thing that you can't you eat ramen in Japan, you're like, this is delicious. You come to America and you're like, ugh, <laughs> ramen is disgusting. You just can't go back. No. You know, so I think that's a good place for yeah, us this to has been a, this has been yeah. really good. Yeah. It's been a really good session. Thanks for watching, and uh, don't forget to subscribe or like this podcast. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much.